the biggest of which 250 million years ago. You can see that drop. It's really quite incredible. It's the greatest mass extinction of all time. And we're going to take, take you to the last mass extinction, that one over there on the right, the last sort of tooth there, or sawtooth. That's the end of the time of the dinosaurs, the end Cretaceous extinction. When you think about extinctions, this little diagram, I like this one to sort of help you uh, sort of conceptualize what happens. So you've got a branching tree of life, and that could be lifestyles, the way the organisms engage with their environment. It could be just their diversity, who they are, sort of the taxonomic organization. Then you have that red line, which is our extinction event. There's lots of different causes um, of these extinctions. Everyone is unique, uh, uh, what caused them. And that sort of trims the tree. And then there's parts of that tree that make it through. And then that blue zone is a really interesting period of time where there's just a few survivors, and they repopulate the planet. And yet, in these five mass extinctions, that's always a period of time that's sort of shrouded in mystery. There's very few fossils. You're looking for things that are very specific, specifically timed. You want to see it right after the extinction. And so often, we don't have good data for those periods of time. And yet, they're sort of the moments, the origins of the time afterwards. So in the case of our most recent mass extinction, you, when you look outside and you look at the life on the planet today, we've got this uh, remarkable diversity, right? We've got the lizards and the, the mammals by you know, looking at that tiger, the birds, the fish, the insects, the plants, and the list goes on. Everything, including us, um, were shaped by the last great mass extinction in Earth's history, right? We would not be sitting here having this talk, the reception tonight, were that mass extinction not to have happened. So we are shaped by the extinctions that come before us. And so there are moments, there are these tragic moments of great loss, but there are also a moment of innovation and growth into the period afterwards. So let me take you back to the last great mass extinction, the end Cretaceous extinction here on Earth, 66 million years ago on some random Tuesday at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, who knows? we were hit by a giant chunk of metal and rock. And that thing was about 10 miles across. It was moving at about 150,000 miles an hour. It came in from the south, we know. It came across first Antarctica, South America, and it slammed into the Yucatan Peninsula, and it liquefied the surface of the earth. It pulled outer space to the tops of the trees, and it was like dropping a stone in water, and there was a, a recentral core that was was taller than Mount Everest for five minutes before itself collapsing. And it left a crater about 120 miles across and sent a shockwave and firestorm across North America. So here's the site of Colorado some 66 million years ago, three minutes after impact. And these two iconic dinosaurs are T-Rex and our Triceratops. I always find this funny, and this, of course, was done by National Geographic of of all things, they seem more occupied with each other than the firestorm coming at them. But, but it really does show this moment, this cataclysmic moment. We think that fire, the firestorm and shockwave made it from, a, from Mexico to Alaska in five minutes. Uh, the material that blew out of the crater rained back to Earth and almost essentially turned the atmosphere into uh, about the temperature it would take to bake cookies in your oven for about an hour. So about 350 degrees Fahrenheit, just the world over. So it's pretty hard to escape from something like that. And a whole myriad of other environmental um, uh, sort, of fa you know, sort of events caused uh, these dinosaurs and many other things to go extinct. And funnily enough, there were other bad things happening at the same time. So India over there on the right-hand side was rocketing northward. Uh, from a plate tectonic perspective, rocketing, so about 10 centimeters a year, um, into Asia, so, and it created the Himalayas that we have today. But at this moment, there were great volcanic eruptions occurring about a million years before the extinction, and they continued afterwards. So we think the ecosystem was sort of stressed the world over. Um, uh, probably looked kind of like the, the smoke here in Colorado, the sort of apocalyptic smoke, but for maybe a couple million years, and we got this punch, this one-two punch of the asteroid uh, during that. So you can see the asteroid impact up there, KPG meteorite impact crater. So here's just what those lava flows look like. This is the Western Ghats in India. So they're big canyons eroded into these ancient lava flows, and the 
And the red area shows you the extent of the lava today. But these things, again, really changed. We think the environment and then the asteroid um, hit during that time. And then those two things, again, conspired to kill the dinosaurs. And we love, Tyler and I love this iconic image of our friend Triceratops, um, you know, just rotting into the, into the dirt there. And our ancestors, uh, those little critters there, uh, crawling all over uh, that dinosaur, those that were to inherit the Earth. So here's a, a, a nice diagram from actually Tyler's backyard. He grew up in the uh, very rural part of, of North Dakota. He grew up in one of the best dinosaur hunting grounds in the world. At about six, he was already finding dinosaurs. And uh, this is from a TV show that he was in. And, but it really shows this great thing here where all the rocks on the bottom are dinosaur filled, are filled with dinosaurs. It's the dinosaur time. And that line right there near the top marks the asteroid impact. And it's marked by a whole bunch of different features. And above it is the, is the time sort of afterward in that moment of where we would like to make uh, a discovery to sort of understand what happened afterwards. But it turns out there's actually these rocks here in our backyard, too. So this is a geologic map showing the Denver Basin in, in um, eastern Colorado and the sites of, of course, Denver and Colorado Springs. And those colored rocks there are a bunch of sediment that came off the Rocky Mountains over a period of about four million years, right at the perfect time to capture the end of the dinosaurs and the beginning of the time afterwards. If we cut that in half, you can kind of see what it looks like. So this is just a nice little line drawing showing you cut through the front range and um, uh, I think the gore range behind it and just gives you a sense of the geology under the surface. And that big green unit, that's the pier shale, which is what we frack for lots of uh, oil and gas. And the chunk at the top, that sort of brown and tan stuff, is the material that was being shed off the Rockies at the end of the Cretaceous. And we spent actually a couple of decades really trying to understand these rocks at the Denver Museum. And uh, there's a couple of cord wells, continuously cored wells in the basin where you plunge a hole down several thousand feet, pull up the rocks to read what is below your feet. And we can take also advantage of an, an unbelievable number of oil and gas and water wells. So here's that same map with just the water wells that we've sort of digitized uh, to put into a model to understand the subsurface. Uh, of the basin to understand the rocks as they outcrop. So this is our 3D geologic model, the different colors uh, suggesting different rock types and all the sort of plunged wells through that. And we can use that to really precisely tell what age rocks hit the surface um, along the front range and what then you can go and look and see what fossils they might, they might hold. And we can overlay this on Google Earth. So here's a neighborhood in Colorado Springs uh, northern Colorado Springs with fossil sites throughout the, the city. We find amazing fossils in the creek beds. And these different boundaries here um, mark, again, the ages of, of the rocks. But that red dashed one is actually the KT boundary, that boundary that marks the extinction of the dinosaurs. And we've modeled it so well, we can go to, like, your backyard and see if the KT boundary runs underneath your, your lawn in the, in the back of your house. And so here's the green sites are all Cretaceous fossil plant sites in this case. The KT boundary, that, that straight line, and then the first sort of tan one is the time afterwards. And so it's really remarkable. The model helps us, guides us through the basin to look uh, for fossils of appropriate age. So we're going to just sort of look at this geologic map for a moment here. But this is the pad of rocks now sort of zoomed in. And if we look at a couple of you know, key cities here, we've got Denver up north, Castle Rock, and Colorado Springs to just sort of help, you, help orient you. And then that line. That tan line is the KT boundary. So the rocks on the outside of that line are all Cretaceous. Dinosaurs are in those rocks. And the rocks on the inside are the time afterwards. It's like a stack of pancakes. You, you're looking at it in plan view, but the ones in the middle are a little higher, and the ones down below are a little lower. So that KT boundary, of course, um, uh, is significant in this story of how life changed at the end of the Cretaceous. Actually, in the Denver Basin, we have the best examples of this boundary anywhere in the world. So the boundary itself is, uh, this is our colleague Rich Barkley from the Smithsonian. He's got his finger on the actual fallout from the asteroid. And these dates here are from volcanic ashes. So volcanoes were blowing up at the same time, not because of the asteroid, but just because it was volcanic at that time. 
and they're dropping into coal beds or in old swamps. And we can date those layers, those white layers, very precisely. And so this, um, this work has helped us understand that the asteroid hit 66.021 million years ago. So 66 million, 21,000 years ago is when the asteroid hit. So we went from this remarkable world of dinosaurs. Dinosaurs occupied this planet far longer than the time since the dinosaurs. Um, and here's just two really cool anzu, or, uh, animals called Anzu wileyi. This is actually a dinosaur that Tyler helped to name. And this is the world in which they lived, an incredibly diverse flora and forest, teeming with all kinds of fascinating life. And of course, these great uh, dinosaurs, ostrich-like dinosaurs here called Anzu. So here we are 66 million years ago, the asteroid hits, and here's our world after quite depauperate of diversity, um, and this is the recovery, uh, maybe a few hundred years to a few thousand years after the impact here in Colorado with just sort of low-growing vegetation, ferns. There's actually a crocodile on that little uh, spit of land there in the middle. So Tyler and I really sort of set out to, to shed some light on this. We both have studied the time before uh, leading up to the extinction, but really thought we could say something about um, the time after. And it was, in, in truth, it was a little bit naive. So many, many scientists have thought they would do this. And we thought also, if we were to be successful, we would have to go to Bolivia or Siberia or somewhere in Africa to make a discovery that really had some interesting information to add to this. But the first thing you need to do is go to your backyard. So we've got the right age rocks. Even though people have been looking for a long time, we understood the age of those rocks. And uh, we were able to go to a place down outside of Colorado Springs uh, that has the right age rocks to study this in really interesting and unusual interval of time after the last great mass extinction, where there should be tons of sort of diversification and things happen happening. And yet, it was sort of shrouded uh, in mystery. And here's what it looks like. So it's actually uh, city of Colorado Springs land. That's Pikes Peak in the distance. There's actually Colorado Springs over that hill. So if you were able to just go over that hill and then it kind of comes down before the mountain in the distance, you would see the sprawl of Colorado Springs. We're actually standing for this picture right at the city dump, <laughs> looking back uh, towards the west. So we are greeted with seagulls and plastic bags constantly out there. But this sort of pile of unassuming rocks here has the right age of... Um, uh, they're the right age to make sort of they had the they should have the right fossils in them and yet people had actually been coming to this area for more than a hundred years so with that i'm going to hand the mic over to tyler to pick up the story thanks ian yeah so it was really quite simple you know this idea that ian and i had i mean all we needed to do was go and find the fossils from this critical interval of time. But like Ian said, it's, it was also very naive because many, many scientists have, have gone to places like this to try to find the fossils uh, from this critical interval. It's the first million years after Earth's last mass extinction. And it's so important because it's the origin of the modern world. We can trace our own origins back, you know, the primates, that is, to right after this mass extinction. So we set out, you know, and we started, at, you know, a number of different places. And uh, Ian was showing us, uh, giving me a tour when I started at the museum of all the different places uh, that had these rocks exposed. You know, again, the rocks of the right age from the first one million years after that mass extinction. And folks have been looking for fossils out here at Corral Bluffs for well over, for right around 100 years. So this is just a picture from a uh, Smithsonian expedition that, that happened in the 1920s and 30s. And they noted that there were dinosaur bo bones at the base of the uh, bluffs, at Corral Bluffs, and then mammals higher up on the bluffs. And they knew there was some sort of an extinction going on somewhere on the bluffs, but the fossils just weren't that great. And the area isn't that big. I mean, the area is, you know, 20 kilometers-ish. And only a, a small fraction of that has actual outcrop. Um, you know, and this here's just an example of some of the fossils that we found when, when we were out there. And this is actually a remarkable discovery. Um, it's, right, that's my hand, so really small. These are, these are a couple of mammal jaws. You can see the teeth poking up. Um, you know, Ian had mentioned I grew up in North Dakota. 
collecting dinosaurs and, you know, all, and, and also looking for fossils after the mass extinction. And I can count on one hand how many mammal jaws I, I found you know, over with 25 years of looking. And here we found two mammal jaws. So you're thinking, you know, gee whiz, you know, that, that's it. That's a great find, right? Well, there, there is more. So you know, we were wa walking around thinking, like, God, there just has to be fossils here. And one of the clues that we had that this area, Corral Bluffs, might be the place where we'd find these fossils was because of this particular fossil here. And this is a palate uh, of a mammal. You can see the teeth here and the teeth over here. This is a really complete, uh, you know, it's, it's only partial, but it's a really complete fossil. It's one of the more complete fossils that I'd ever seen. So Ian and I are out there looking for fossils, not finding a whole lot. But, you know, we had this in the back of our brains. It was like, well, there was one good fossil here, found here. There's got to be more. Um, and I was walking around thinking about some of my fossil finding experiences in South Africa, because that's another place where I do a lot of field work. And there they look for fossils not by looking for bone, but by actually sort of honing in on a certain type of rock or a concretion. So here is a, a concretion that I found in South Africa with part of a, uh, an early mammal skull sticking out. So I thought, huh, maybe the fossils are inside of the concretions or are inside of these rocks. We might as well give it a shot, right? We're not finding anything else. So I picked up a concretion and I just whacked it with my rock hammer. And it was just one of the most remarkable moments of my life because there, it's hard to see with this picture, but I cut through the skull of a, of a mammal. And that exact moment, I was holding the most complete mammal skull I had ever seen from this interval of time. I mean, truly an incredible uh, moment. You might be able to see a tooth down here and down here. I'll, I'll show some better images here shortly. But it, it, was, it was so remarkable, just the way it happened. I cracked open the rock, call Ian over and, and uh, a volunteer who was with us. We start, you know, high-fiving and celebrating and, you know, we'd found the fossil, right? We'd found the, you know, cool fossil. And, uh, you know, I, I sit, sit down and start taking care of the fossil that I had just broken. And uh, Ian and Sharon, this volunteer of ours, they go out. They now know what to look for, right? They know that the fossils are not going to look like what I have down here, but they're going to be inside of these rocks, right? So here's a fossil of a mammal, uh, what it looked like when we found it, and then here was what, what was inside of that. The fossils were inside of these concretions. So within a matter of about 30 minutes, uh, Ian comes carrying over a, a, a mammal skull. Sharon comes over, and she's carrying a mammal skull. Within about a half an hour, we had found, we'd more than doubled the number of skulls known from this interval of time. So it was just truly, truly remarkable. So the fossils are found inside of these concretions. Now, a concretion is just a type of rock that forms around an organic nucleus. And so here's a concretion, and that organic nucleus could be a mammal skull, like you're really, really lucky, or it might just be bacteria. Um, but it was a complete game changer for, in our ability to find fossils from this critical interval of time. Because we looked across the landscape, you know, and we could see these concretions just all over the landscape. And so we just ran around uh, like little kids, just picking up one skull after another. Um, and then the challenge was, so now we have all these amazing fossils inside of these concretions. Can we clean them, right? Can we extract the fossils from their concretionary tomb? And that was the next challenge that we had. And uh, we hired some of the best preparators around the, the U.S. I, would, I still do is send them out uh, these concretions, and then they send back these, uh, these beautiful fossils. And so just, again, one by one, you know, one concretion after another. And you can see why folks have been going to this area for over 100 years, including our own museum, which had been going there for about 50 years, and not finding a lot of fossils. Because this is what they looked like. You know, they didn't look like kind of inconspicuous rocks. But inside of these rocks are just the most remarkable. And what's remarkable is how complete they are. Um, we just have never had fossils this complete from this interval of time. So we went from having mere fragments, you know, jaws, broken bits of turtle shell, 
an isolated you know, tooth or osteoderm from a crocodile to now having complete mammal skulls, complete crocodiles, turtles, you know, the whole ecosystem trapped inside of these concretions. And so now my office is covered in concretions because we continue to bring these concretions home. Um, you can see we're still going out. Uh, you can tell this is, this is field work in the age of COVID, right? <laughs> So we're still going out there. I was out there last week. We're still finding amazing things. This is a, a crocodile skeleton. So you can maybe see the skull down here, then the body, and then uh, the tail going down here. So a whole crocodile skeleton encased in, in uh, the concretionary tomb. And we've been able to prepare a lot of these fossils. Uh, this is just a small subset of the fossils. And we have new species of mammals, new species of turtles, new species of crocodile. Um, here's one uh, example, here's one new species. This is a, a, a new species of soft shell turtle. So here's the top shell, here's the bottom shell, um, and here's, here's what we think it may have looked like. Um, and this is a, a, an animal that uh, Ian and I just named, a paper that just came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, here's another specimen, a really one of my, cool, or one of my favorite uh, types of turtle. Um, this is an animal called Palatobana which I think kind of looks like a little Darth Vader, you know, the little rounded skull. But this is a new species of turtle in another paper that Ian and I had just published uh, maybe a week or two ago. Um, and if it's not new to science, if it's not a new species, uh, what we have is the most complete specimen of a known species. So this is just one example. This is an animal called a tinea labus, and I have a skull, a cast of a skull right here. But this was known from you know, only fr mere fragments. Um, and now since this discovery, we now have whole skulls as well as uh, complete jaws. And not only that, we have the plants. And I'll hand it out back over to Ian. Thank you. So we had this amazing discovery of all these mammals, and among other things. And so we had part of the ecosystem, and we wanted to build that picture around it, really flesh out the ecosystem, if you will, to say something about how life recovered after the extinction of the dinosaurs. And it turns out these rocks have a great record of fossil plants as well. So our team is, is actually, I don't know, we're up to probably like 30 scientists or something now, and there's a segment of us, I'm one of them, who are the plant people. So I'm a paleobotanist by training, and I study the, uh, the sort of plant record through this. We also have people who are fossil pollen experts. They're called palynologists, and they study the fossil pollen. So on the right-hand side, you can see, um, excuse me, is that, nope, that's the left-hand side. On the left-hand side, you can see uh, uh, fossil imprints of leaves and that kind of thing, those sort of fish tail-looking fossils. Those are bits of palm and that kind of thing. And the leaves really give you a sense of the forest above that spot in the ground. So imagine mining into the hill, you're pulling out rocks, you're splitting them open, you're seeing the ancient forest above your head. And you get a sense of the diversity and what lived in a particular area on the landscape. But they're sort of patchy around the, around the they're not preserved everywhere. So you kind of move through time finding those. But the pollen is everywhere. So you can take any little sort of thimble-sized chunk of rock dissolve it in hydrofluoric acid and uh, centrifuge out what's left, and you can get the fossil pollen from that period of time. And it's just like today, right? We're outside sneezing because of rabbit brush and that kind of thing. It's in the air everywhere. So if you took a little sa sample of river mud, you would get the forest of Salida if you took a little bit of uh, river mud from outside uh, the building here. And so that's what the palynologists do. So on the right-hand side, you see pollen that has been strained, and then it gets stained red, so you can see it in the, in the slide. But those are pollen grains from the Cretaceous. You see lots of different kinds down there. There's little, there's little Ks by them. I don't know if you can see that. Let's see here if I can do this with that. There we go. So the little Ks here, these are things, these are types of pollen that belong to trees that lived only in the Cretaceous. There's some other things here. That's a bit of a leaf, cuticle of a leaf, that kind of thing. But all these different pollen grains. We have the extinction event. And what we find afterwards is almost pure ferns. 
ferns come back and proliferate everywhere. And this is common after forest fires and volcanic eruptions in particular. And we think it was a global phenomenon after the asteroid. We call this the fern spike. So everywhere above the boundary, we find almost only ferns. And then the new world comes back. So this is the world afterwards with all kinds of different things. There should be little peas by those, but I, they're gone for some reason. Anyway, they're different shapes, different grains than down here, right? And so the palynologists can figure out the regional forest from any little chunk of rock. So that gives us a perspective of, of everything from the diversity of, of the forest, but they also give us a window into the climate. And Tyler will talk a little bit about that later in the talk. But they give us a sense of the climate. And you know this from the plants that live outside today. They're tuned to their local climate. So we were preparing all these fossils. So this is just a really fun, uh, yet again, another mechanical um, you know, preparation of a beautiful little mammal skull. But that's only part of the story. So um, here's Tyler at the Wheat Ridge Animal Hospital at like uh, midnight on a Friday with the tech there. And he's CT scanning uh, these uh, skulls in the CT scanner. So this is what you know, your dog might go through if they're feeling bad and then they come out. And, but we use the same thing with um, uh, the fossils. And this lets us peer inside these things. So this sort of drab fossil, uh, this is not the one I showed you before, but a different fossil. It's grayed out here. That's what it was on the surface. And what's in teal and purple here are the brain and inner ears of this animal. And that's preserved inside. We never had this kind of perspective before because it was all mechanical preparation to look at the surface. So I'm going to pull away the gray area, pull away the skull, and we'll just look at the brain. And uh, here's the brain itself. And that funny vertical slices there, that's the x-ray machine. Because CT just lines up thousands of x-rays, and then you stack them together. And we do all this in a computer space. We have a lab at the museum that does this kind of work. And we've developed a number of proxies to say something about these critters from not only their inner ears, so again, here are the ears, the semicircular canals, but also something about their brain. So given the size of the brain, we call this an encephalization quotient, we can tell that this animal is not particularly intelligent. Um, of course, it's not having to run from raptors and T-Rex, right? It's after the extinction of the dinosaurs. Did not have much in the way of an agility score. We can learn that from its inner ears. Slow-moving, lumbering creature, probably nothing chasing it or on the landscape. But it had an incredible amount of its brain dedicated uh, to its sense of smell. So that's this part of the brain up here. So it probably had this incredible sense of smell. So these early animals, you can start to build a picture of these things rummaging around on a forest, not worrying about running from anything, um, not, not terribly intelligent, just following their nose wherever they go. So uh, this is sort of some of the cool discoveries that are happening now. And we actually have a paper in review uh, with a team out of the UK on just this work, looking at early uh, placental mammal brain um, uh, uh, brains uh, through this time period. But the discoveries go well beyond that. So, uh, Tyler was quite interested to see if the plants could say something about why these animals were changing over time. We're going to go through a little sequence soon about how these animals were changing over time. And there was a big jump in the record at one point, and he was pushing us, the plant people, to say something about that. What was happening with the forests? And so one of the things we keyed in on was, could there be a new food source on the landscape? And we kind of knew that the fossil beans or legumes should be around at this moment, but none had been found this old. The oldest had been found about four million years younger in South America, but the evidence from looking at the family trees pointed to this moment. And so we were digging and we were actually filming. There was a film crew with us through most of this discovery. And this young student, she was 14 at the time, Aeon Way Smith, was listening keenly to this conversation. And literally, I was doing an interview on camera and she kept tapping me on the shoulder and uh, I finally looked around, and she was holding the world's oldest fossil bean. And she literally found it on camera. Of course, the cameras just went straight to her. And, uh, she, and if you watch the show about this, she has this, she's just beaming at this moment. It's really incredible. Um, but it sort of helped sort of tell this story. There was a brand new food source in the landscape for these new mammals. And Aeon found the oldest legume. Legumes are... Um, the third most speciose group of plants on the planet today, more than 20,000 species of them. We think of them as green beans and things like, I'm sure we all ate legumes for dinner tonight. 
Um, but here's a, a bean pod and a couple of little tiny leaflets. Uh, but they are second only to grains in terms of uh, importance of uh, food source to us uh, from the plant world. Um, and, and they're incredibly important to, to animals around uh, the planet. And the first ones, as far as we know, are right here in Colorado. And this young student, Aeon, found it uh, literally on camera. And so here's our reconstruction of this uh, beautiful early legume. Uh, in Colorado. And so it's being written up right now. One of our, our postdocs is just finishing it up. So the, the discoveries went well beyond the vertebrates and extended to the plants as well. So uh, before I hand it back to Tyler to sort of sum up um, uh, this story, I really want to drive home this point of how special this was. And we've, we came to start calling this the trifecta of paleontology. So if you were to go to any period of time in the rock record throughout the long history of life on Earth and were able to find not only the vertebrates but also plants, but then be able to tell time in those rocks, you, would be, you, would, you could spend your career working on that moment, regardless of when it was, right, and how it related to the sort of uh, long span of life on Earth. And in this moment that is so shrouded in mystery where we didn't have much information about the origins of our own world, we found all three of these things. Not only did we have the plants, the incredible plants, to go along with these amazing vertebrate uh, skulls, usually the chemistry of the preservation of one or the other uh, prohibits the other from being preserved. Both were there. We were actually also able to precisely tell time from the rocks, which is no, is no easy feat. You need the right kinds of rocks to date to tell time. So we had the clock, and we had the, the, the animals, and we had the plants to sort of put this story together. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Tyler to take it all the way home. All right. So when I, when I started, I said all we had to do was find the fossils, right? We knew there was going to be a cool story. Many scientists have been trying to find fossils from this interval of time, but all we had to do was find them. So now we found the fossils. So what does it say? What does it tell us? Well, this is what we knew before, right? We knew that 66 million years ago, a giant asteroid struck Earth, wiped out the dinosaurs, and then we didn't really know a whole lot. There was quite a gap in our, our, our fossil record. We just didn't have good fossils. So now we have the fossils. One of the first things that we needed to do was figure out the age of all of our fossils, you know, that third part of that trifecta. Um, that was the work, you know, Ian and I get to come and give all these talks, but there were, there were 16 scientists as part of this particular project. And this was the work of uh, Ken Weisenberger, who really was able to tie together all of our, our fossil localities. And then we needed to figure out the age of the fossils, and that was the work of Anthony Fontes. Um, he did what's, we looked at the, uh, the paleomagnetism of the rocks. And I won't go into that, but... Um, Suffice to say that uh, we learned from their work that we had the first one million years after the mass extinction. So the extinction was six, just over 66 million years ago. Uh, I put this at zero because this really is the biologic reset button. Um, and so we go from zero to a million years. And then we have all these amazing vertebrate fossils, right? We have all these skulls. And what can you do with the skulls? You can do a lot of things, right? Ian was talking about looking at the size of their brains and their inner ears to figure out where they were living and how smart they were. But one of the easiest things you can do when you have skulls versus just fragments of teeth is look at body size. And body size is so important uh, in the ecology of all animals, of where they live, of what they're eating. And so that was the first thing we, we, we did, was just look at the body size and how did that body size change through time. So here you can see, you know, the largest animal down here is about, a uh, mammal is about 12 pounds. And then the largest mammal to survive the mass extinction is about um, one pound or, or so. And then you can see there's a couple of distinct jumps in body size at 300,000 years and at 700,000 years. And so that's where I was pushing Ian and his team of paleobotanists uh, to tell me, like, what was going on with the plants? You know, these animals aren't evolving in isolation. There's got to be something going on with the ecology. And so he and his team got to work, collected a lot of plant fossils, and uh, counted a lot of pollen grains. And from the pollen, we were able to figure out that there was a distinct spike in ferns. So down here is just a percent of the number of grains, or, you know, there's a lot of ferns 
um, right here. And so this is what we call the fern world. So when you look at a, 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 a pollen slide, it would be covered in fern spores. And then we were able to learn from the pollen as well that there was a dis, there was a moment in time for about 300,000 years where the world, you know, the, where this area seemed to be dominated by palms, by uh, so we dubbed this the uh, the palm world. Um, and we we saw that not only from the pollen, so there here is what we see in you know looking underneath the microscope, but we also find we also continue to find lots of uh, in situ. Uh, palm tree trunks, here's a big palm frond, here's palm flowers. So it was a world for about 300,000 years that was dominated by palms. And then also looking at the uh, pollen, we were able to see that the forests were really starting to come back. And one of the main groups of plants that were, was coming, coming back were, that was the walnut family. There was a diversification of the walnut family. And so we dubbed this the pecan pie world because pecan and walnut. And it's at that exact interval that you start getting some chunkier mammals out on the landscape. So new, foods, new food appearing on the landscape, mammals getting bigger. And then likewise, the last bit we see here is the appearance of the legume. Aeon's legume, and that corresponds, again, with this jump in body size here. So legumes are, of course, loaded with protein, and so we dubbed this the uh, protein bar uh, world. And so, uh, you know, I'm not going to go into this too much, but uh, the leaves also tell us a lot about the temperature. So if you can go, go out on, onto uh, the landscape today and count the number of species of, of, leaf, of, of, of plants that have toothed margins on their leaves versus smooth margins, that correlates really well with temperature in modern ecosystems. So it's a very powerful tool for inferring you know, ancient temperature. And so Ian and the team looked at that, and we noticed there were three warming intervals. And those warming intervals correspond with the jump, you know, with the changes in the worlds as well, you know, going from the palm world to the pecan pie world. Uh, we, get a, we have a warming interval. We have new plants. You know, the warming interval, we think, is impacting the evolution of the forests, which in turn is impacting the uh, ecology and evolution of these mammals. So we see these three distinct warming intervals. So we sort of had it all, right? We had time, uh, temperature, and plants, and animals. So now we, we can really tie it all together uh, with a series of really amazing pieces of artwork by uh, uh, Andre Atuchin, um, one of our uh, paleo artists who, well, up until recently, lived in Siberia. But these reconstructions are incredibly accurate. So, so much time and energy goes into each of these reconstructions. So every single plant and animal um, has been found, you know, that, that builds these reconstructions. So what can we say? This is what the world looked like 66 million years ago, right before the asteroid struck. And then, of course, he had the giant asteroid struck. That's the single worst day for multicellular life on Earth. The single worst day. Uh, pretty crazy. A pretty bad day to be, to be around. 75% of, of animals and plants go extinct. But as we all know, we're standing here today. Some things survived. And this is what the world here in Colorado would have looked like, you know, right after the mass extinction. For tens to, to hundreds and to maybe thousands of years after the mass extinction. Um, you'd have, of course, the Rockies in the background. Here is the largest mammal that survived the mass extinction. So that's about a half a kilogram, so it's about the size of a, of a subway, uh, a rat. Um, and then this is the um, largest animal that survived the mass extinction. This is a big turtle, um, a big uh, turtle called Exestemes. And these animals were living in these fern-dominated forests with, you know, a really patchy forests, and kind of in, in, uh, here and there, these uh, patchy forests made up of, of angiosperms as well as lots of, of, of palms. And then for about 300,000 years, you had a world, at least here in the front range, that was dominated by palms, this palm-dominated forest. Um, and in this palm-dominated forest, the, you know, the, the forests were starting to come back a little bit. Um, the 
mammals were really starting to bounce back in terms of diversity, um, and as well as size. You have an animal here that's about the size of a raccoon. This is the same size as mammals that lived alongside the dinosaurs. So it took about 300,000 years for mammals to regain, you know, you know, uh, that size, that body mass. And then right at 300,000 years, in that warm, one warming interval, we have, you know, a, a big change in the forest ecology. The forests are really starting to come back. One of the things that really bounces back are, are the, uh, is the walnut family, the pecan pie moment. And in that exact moment, we get these mammals that are much, much bigger uh, than anything that, that lived during the age of the dinosaurs. These animals are 35 times larger than the animals that survived the mass extinction at 300,000 years after the mass extinction. And then the last interval of time is the uh, protein bar world, and this is 700,000 years after the mass extinction. And here, the forests are you know, starting to really bounce back. You get these new uh, food sources on the landscape, these caloric rich food source that we think some of these mammals were eating. And at that same interval of time, we have mammals now, uh, the, these two here, and I have cast down on the table here, these animals are 100 times bigger than the animals that survived the mass extinction. So 100 times bigger in 700,000 years. We won't see a comparable jump in body, body size for another 35 million years. So it all, I think, really speaks to the resilience of life and to you know, just how quickly life bounced back after, you know, again, the single worst day for life on Earth. So pretty, pretty remarkable, pretty fast but pretty slow, obviously, in, in, in human time. So, you know, we were really lucky that we, we published this uh, discovery in one of the premier scientific journals. Uh, we worked with filmmakers at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute to uh, put together this uh, documentary. Um, so if you haven't watched it, you can, I think you can still stream it uh, online at pbs.org. And then we worked with uh, uh, folks at our own museum to put together this remarkable exhibit uh, that displays um, some of the best fossils that we found uh, from this, this critical uh, interval of time. And it was just really, tr truly a, an amazing experience, I think, for, for both Ian and myself, particularly being able to do this, this NOVA uh, documentary. And with that, I just want to play sort of the highlight reel uh, from this uh, documentary. It's a really bad time for life on Earth. I mean, you could go your entire career and not find a skull from this time period. That's how rare they are. They are excruciatingly hard to find. There's just nothing like picking up something and finding out it's something amazing. It was crazy the way it happened. Bam, we, uh, we hit a big. I just found a mammal skull. <laughs> it was like opening a door into a new world. We want to build up a picture of how life evolved at this period. Some things survive, right? Including some of our earliest, earliest ancestors. Over the last 66 million years, mammals evolved an incredible diversity of forms. That moment of rapid mammal evolution is effectively the trigger to our existence here on planet Earth. Thank you.
critical about climate is that it is always changing, right? There's these broad cycles in Earth's history in which uh, climate, it's really reservoirs of carbon move from the sediments at the bottom of the ocean and trapped in mountains and stuff and get into the atmosphere and warm the planet over millions of years and it cools. Actually, building of mountains cools the planet, so the building of the Himalaya has cooled the planet that we live in today. Uh, just the erosion of those mountains soaks up um, CO2, essentially, out of, out of the fresh water. It's, it, anyway, there's a whole chemical process behind it. But those changing climates do affect the evolution of plants and animals because it sort of moves their sort of habitable zones around the planet. So they're moving, they're migrating, they're interacting with one another, and they need to adapt and sort of compete in the um, sort of environmental space in which they live. Um, and that puts selective pressure on them, to, which is one of the important parts of the evolutionary process. Of course, today, um, we're, in a, we're in sort of a runaway system, right? We are uh, probably a hundred, our climate is changing more than a hundred times as fast as it ever did in these moments. Um, and it's just because we're playing the game of geology, right? We're taking the carbon that's um, in these different reservoirs and we're moving it around, right? And, um, and it has an effect on the world's climate. So we've, of course, got a little bit of a TBD moment <laughs> right now, but uh, it certainly has had a big impact. Um, I, I'm reminded of Jurassic Park, and they had the line about life finds a way. Thank you again for being here. Are there other areas on the planet that you could imagine you would find some of the same evidence and kind of corroborate this, this find? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, the answer is it's got to be yes. But we just haven't found it yet. You know, Mother Nature tends to repeat herself, so it would be remarkable to have this be the only spot on the globe where we get this type of preservation. Because I think that's the real key, is to have these fossils preserved in these uh, concretions. And uh, yeah, what we've looked in other areas. I've looked in my hometown uh, area uh, in the Dakotas and Montana to see if there's a similar type of preservation. Um, there is not. Uh, I've looked elsewhere, but it's only a matter of time before I think somebody else finds this same type of, of uh, preservation, probably from this, you know, it could be from this same interval of time as well. Any other? Oh. Well, my, my question was pretty similar. I was just at wondering if scientists around the world were breaking up these rocks. <laughs> But I guess you kind of answered that, that not yet. Yeah, I mean, and, and I should also say on top of that, that this type of preservation, this, these uh, fossils inside of concretions, are, is really common in the invertebrate world. So if you go look for ammonites or you know, other creatures, you know, you know, the pier shale or anything that lives in the ocean, you usually find them in these concretions. This type of preservation is just really abnormal in a terrestrial environment, in a land-bearing environment. It's a kind of unheard of. And so um, I've, I've had some colleagues reach out, some colleagues in Morocco, and they think they found a similar type of deposit. Um, so it's only, again, I think it's only a matter of time before more of these come to light in a terrestrial environment, because this type of preservation is the norm for marine environments. As you described the plants changing from ferns to, to palm to walnut to the legumes. It seems awfully fast. Is that, is that your impression? Or, and what makes that mechanism? How is there such a significant change? Yeah, a great observation and great point. Um, it is fast. And we think that those that changing climate really drove immigration, right? Drove things that probably, if, if we had the fossils, we could find in more southern latitudes at that time. So it's probably, these aren't probably the first land, uh, legumes on the landscape, right? They probably have, they were probably further south, they may have evolved in the tropics, and may have been around for a couple of million years beforehand, but that warming interval that we sort of observed for it gave them the sort of ability to move northward. Their, their climatic sort of zone expanded, and, uh, and then we saw the animals moving in. Uh, but it's always really hard to tease out just your question. Is, are the things evolving in place? Or are they moving into an area? And the only way to do that is to have more sites around the planet to sort of, to 
to tease that very question out. Are there characteristics of rocks that make you believe that they have fossils in them? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, know, you need to have a sedimentary rock to, to start with. Um, that's the only place where you'll find uh, fossils. But yeah, we spend a lot of time looking at geologic maps um, to, to figure out you know, where we can go in the world to answer the questions that we're interested in. And so Ian and I, that's what we did when we were started on, on this particular uh, journey was looking at maps from around the world that had terrestrial, uh, Cretaceous, and, and Paleogene boundaries for, you know, and, and, and land-based ones. And, uh, and, and you go to this, these sedimentary basins, and then it just takes a little bit of luck. Um, so it's that, and then also just pouring through the literature, because at this point, most parts of the globe have been explored a little bit um, in terms of looking for fossils. So even here, this, this particular area, you know, folks were looking there in the 1900s. So... But yeah, a lot, of, a lot of looking at maps and figuring out where the, the correct sedimentary basins are. are. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, presenting this wonderful program to us. We're, uh, we're all grateful. Uh, question. Uh, you're using uh, CT scans to evaluate a bunch of things. For field work, I wonder if the portable ultrasound units like the physicians use would be of any benefit to you. Yeah, I, I don't think so because the, uh, the CT scanners that we use are so incredibly powerful uh, because we're trying to pick out slight changes in density. The density is so similar between the concretionary mass and the bone itself. You, know, you, have, to, you have to hit these things with a, with a lot of power. And so I think that would be a challenge, I think, for, for you know, uh, using any, even using medical technology, it hasn't been that useful. We have to send a lot of these fossils to facilities that only look at you know, minerals or iron. Or so we spend a lot of time working with Lockheed Martin, where they CT scan space shuttle parts, you know, before before uh, launching. Um, so interestingly enough, other uh, we've had other folks ask that same question, and I, I, I haven't tried it, but I think we would. Uh, I don't think it'd be successful just because the density between the bone and the rock is so similar. But it might be worth trying. Maybe we should give it a shot. Do you find any insects? Oh, man, insects. Yeah, there's, so it's interesting. There's some things that we don't find, and insects are one of them. But we do find uh, evidence of insects on the leaves. So, you know, in, a lot of insects eat the leaves, and there's a whole science behind that. In one of our postdocs at the museum, uh, Gussie McCracken, that's what she studies, is looking at leaf damage. And you can learn a, a lot about what types of insects were on the landscape by looking at the damage to the leaves. But no cockroaches? <laughs> no, no cockroaches <laughs> yet. <laughs> they were there, though. <laughs> They've always been there. Thank you. Can you speak a little bit about the KT boundary, the minerals, how, you, how it was determined that that was the moment of impact? And is that planet, is it, is it over the entire planet? Yeah, so the minerals uh, that folks look for. Yeah, this, so this is an idea that was put forth in the early 1980s, uh, a group out of Berkeley. And they looked, um, they were doing a different study, but they, they knew there was an extinction interval here, and so they looked at rare earth uh, minerals, and they looked at iridium, and they were shocked when they saw an iridium spike right across the, uh, the boundary, and they found that worldwide. They found that in Italy, they found it in Montana, they found it in other places, and so they're the ones that published this idea that it was an asteroid that struck Earth, and it was met with widespread uh, skepticism, particularly among the paleontologists who just said it was, it was a bitter, bitter uh, battle in the 1980s and even in the 1990s. Uh, but at this point, we found that iridium spike uh, worldwide. We can also look at the, um, the certain, there's certain minerals that become shocked um, because they're formed under intense heat and pressure. So they only form uh, at a, a atomic blast uh, sites, uh, testing facilities. 
or when asteroids uh, uh, hit, hit the Earth. And so these are called shock minerals. So you can look at these minerals underneath the scanning electron microscope, and it's, uh, you know, the, the deformation, you know, the heat and uh, whatnot change the sort of the, the structure of the crystals. And so it kind of looks like a, a cat got a hold of the, uh, of the mineral because there's little scratch marks all over it. So those are two of the primary things. But there's a number of other things that people look at as well. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, the evidence—the evidence that it was there was an asteroid. Um, of course, in the '90s, in the '80s, people were like, "Well, there was an asteroid. Like, where's the crater?" And then, in like I think 1999, they found the crater. So I mean, there's a lot of evidence, you know, uh, worldwide that it was an asteroid that struck Earth. And so. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So there, you have to sign up as a uh, as a tour. So at the, with the Corral Bluffs Alliance, uh, COBA, I think they have a website, right? If you, if you Google Corral Bluffs, um, it'll, it'll show up. And then, yeah, you, you can go, but you just have to sign up. And there's a, there's, um, a number of amazing tour guides that use a, you know, a lot of the artwork that we've put together and you know, tell, are able to tell the story. And it's great to be able to, you know, they have certain casts of fossils, and you can see just lots and lots of, uh, of wood fossils on the landscape as well. Pretty remarkable. I would highly recommend going. Unbiased yeah. opinion. You should be glad I'm here to ask dumb questions. Um, so, sadly for me, when I look at rocks, they just look like rocks to me. I was lucky enough to date a geologist at one time, and he was able to pick up rocks that were geodes. <laughs> so you split them open, they're pretty crystals. So. Talk to, yes, thank you. Talk to me about the difference between, I can't even say the word. Concretion. Okay, concretion. Okay, well, that's it. I'm from Texas. We don't talk like that. Um, talk to us about the time period of geodes and this. Yeah, so great. So um, they're just two different processes of, of uh, sort of, a growth of rock around a um, sort of central nucleus. Uh, geodes actually grow in, um, and so they're a cavity, and there's crystals growing on the inside. Um, and I actually don't know why they're hollow. They're a vol they're, they occur in volcanic provinces, so they're ancient volcanic sediments typically, and lots of water and other fluids are moving through the rock, and the crystals precipitate inside the cavities of these sort of round rocks. And then if you have the eye for the geode, you, you can just go across the ground and be like, that's a geode, and you pick it up, and boom, that's incredible. And it's the same kind of thing. And I don't think Tyler and I could walk out and find geodes, because we're just not trained in geode, geode looking. But it's the same kind of idea, right? So once we knew the search image for these things, we saw them everywhere. These sort of grow out, right? So there's an organic nucleus, and then, um, the, that skull is buried in sediment and, and mud or sand, and then minerals con conglomerate on the outside, sort of like it looks like it's been rolled in cake dough or something like that. And it can be a skull, it can be a little chunk of wood, it could be a piece of bone, it could even be like a little bacterial mass that gets these things started. So when you look across, if you ever visit Corral Bluffs, you'll look across the landscape and see millions of these concretions. Only one in three or 400 has a, a fossil in it. Uh, the rest are probably just some sort of bacterial or plant um, nucleus that got the mineral forming process to form. Uh, but it's, think of it as sort of like a pearl and an oyster, that kind of thing. might be a nice way to think about it. All right. I'm not seeing any more hands up. So thank you all for the great questions. And if you guys would just hold tight for a second. Okay, here's, the, here's that. You want to just sit like that? Yeah. And here's the mic. Okay. You want me to, I'll stand behind you. Okay. okay. So, so we um, like to thank our speakers with speaker gifts. And I'm going to start with Tyler because it's your first time. Yep. <laughs> 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 
So our, our speaker gift is a Amazonite crystal. Beautiful. It's a uh, uh, microcline that uh, that has um, iron in it. <laughs> anyway, um, it's uh, if you get tired of looking at fossils, if you went around the Pikes Peak region and looked for pegmatite, you could find some Amazonite there. Oh, that's beautiful. Yep. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. And, and Ian, this is not your first time. <laughs> you already have an Amazonite, and so we didn't want to give you the same thing again. But um, recognizing that you're going to be probably traveling the world with uh, National Geographic, we'd really like you to uh, wear something from the local area. And uh, so this is a Melanzana hoodie. Oh, thank you. That is awesome. <laughs> wow. That's, thank you so much. Made in Leadville. Yes, thank you. So thank you very much for, for taking the time to come down here and talk to us. And to the kids in the schools, I know they're going to be excited. I'm going to see them out along the uh, bluffs around here looking Cracking for concretions. Oh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you all for coming. We appreciate everybody turning out. Wonderful. Everybody be safe getting home. Good night. <laughs>